I'm Will Douglas Heaven, a senior editor for AI at MIT Technology Review. And I'd like to welcome you all back for our second day of MTech MIT. We're going to hit the ground running today with a session that goes straight to the heart of some of the biggest questions in AI right now. In half an hour, my fellow senior editor, Karen Howe, will be chatting to three leading researchers who are each pushing AI in new and important directions. But I get to kick things off with a conversation that's going to take us back to basics. I think you're going to love our first guest. When it comes to AI, one of the biggest questions today is simply, are we doing it right? We've clearly hit gold with AI's current paradigm, deep learning. This technology's greatest hits are well known, from image recognition to natural language processing to superhuman game playing, all the way to the myriad smaller impacts it may be having on many of your businesses. In fact, the success of this one technology is why we're even talking about AI this morning. And it's certainly why I have a job. And yet the cracks are showing. For all its success, deep neural networks are still strikingly stupid. They have no common sense. They make errors that no human baby ever would. They're fragile and inflexible. In fact, they're perhaps the most expensive one-trick ponies ever invented. They may excel at doing a single specific task astonishingly well, but change that task even slightly and they'll break. Alpha Zero can play Go or it can play chess, but not at the same time. GPT-3 is a fine mimic, but it's utterly mindless and has no idea what it is saying. It's clear that the intelligence half of AI is still lacking. But maybe there's another way. The search for AI has always been about trying to build machines that think, at least in some sense. But the question of how alike artificial and biological thinking should be has divided opinion for decades. Early efforts to build AI involved decision-making processes that were loosely inspired by the way humans seem to think. Similarly, today's deep neural networks are loosely inspired by the way interconnected neurons fire in the brain. But loose inspiration is as far as it goes. Our next guest thinks we can do better. Jeff Hawkins is a neuroscientist, AI researcher, and tech entrepreneur. Today, he runs Numenta, a neuroscience research company based in Silicon Valley. Jeff has straddled the two worlds of neuroscience and AI for nearly 40 years. In 1986, after a few years as a software engineer at Intel, he turned up at the University of California, Berkeley to start a PhD in neuroscience, hoping to, well, figure out how intelligence worked. But his ambition hit a wall when he was told there was nobody there to help him with such a big picture project. Frustrated, he swapped Berkeley for Silicon Valley and in 1992 founded Palm Computing, which developed the Palm Pilot, a precursor today to today's smartphones. But his fascination with brains never went away. 15 years later, he returned to neuroscience and set up the Redwood Center for Theoretical Neuroscience, now at Berkeley. At Numenta, he and his team study the neocortex, the part of the brain responsible for everything we associate with intelligence. After a string of breakthroughs in the last few years, Numenta changed its focus from brains to AI, applying what it has learned about biological intelligence to machines. Jeff's ideas have inspired big names in AI, including Andrew Ng, and drawn accolades from the likes of Richard Dawkins, who wrote an enthusiastic foreword to Hawkins' latest book, A Thousand Brains, A New Theory of Intelligence. Welcome, Jeff. I will, thanks. It's great to be here. Now, before we dive in, and we've got a ton to talk about, um, I just want to remind the audience again that they can leave questions in the chat, um, and they'll be fed to me back here, and I'll, I'll ask Jeff the, the best ones. Um, as time permits. Um, Jeff, let's just jump in perhaps, you know, with this sort of the provocative statement. Um, what's wrong with, with deep learning? What's wrong with what we're doing today? Well, it, it's a great technology. And as you point out, it's, it's quite successful. So I'm not here to diss deep learning. Um, but as you pointed out, and, and yesterday, uh, Kevin from Microsoft pointed out, there's no intelligence in, in this, these systems. They're very brittle. Um, they really can't, they're not flexible. Uh, they're not even close to you know what a child can do, um, uh, and uh, so they're they're sort of a they're they're very interesting statistical techniques for for mapping inputs to outputs, but there really is no there's no there there there's no person you know there's no intelligence there there's no understanding what's going on, and um, and so we have a long way to go. So I'm not predicting that you know today's AIs are going to uh, disappear, but we we really haven't started building artificial intelligence yet. Um, but we can, and uh, we, we know how to do it now. Uh, we just have to rethink uh, the whole process. So tell us a little bit about, about that. I mean, I love the, the, the confidence with which you say, you know, we, we know how to do it now. Um, you know, convince me. Okay, well, it's, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of technology still to be done, but you know, essentially 
actually, um, AI requires having a model of the world. Uh, and the model has to be everything in it. Like you, know, you all know about basic things about doors and cars and people and words and and uh, what the brain does and what we've discovered is it, it it builds this model of everything we know. And we've learned the basics of how it does it. Um, you can state them pretty simply. Uh, it's a um, it's a sensory motor system, meaning you have to move to learn, which most AI systems today don't do. Um, but we know that's true. And we also know how these models are implemented in the brain. So how is it that you know what a coffee cup is? Or how is it that you know what uh, a building is? Or how is it you know, um, you know what a dog is? Um, we have these internal models. We, we've learned how those things are, are, are learned inside uh, your head. And it's, it's using something called a reference frame, which is pretty straightforward, um, but some people struggle with it a little bit. But it's like, you know, you have like a structure in your head that represents the structure of the world. Um, and it's not just data. It's data at locations in this reference frames. So it's, uh, we don't want to get into all the details here today, but we understand that it's a sensory motor process. We understand that we learn by moving. We understand how the information is stored in the neurons in your head. Um, and, uh, and this is what AI needs. AI needs to have an internal model of the world, not just how to play Go or how to play you know, a game. It needs to know everything, even at a basic level. Uh, and that's what we do, and that's what makes us intelligent. So, I mean, we're going to get on and talk about AI, of course, but let's stick on the neuroscience um, part of the story uh, for a little bit longer. The, the subtitle to your book is you know, A New Theory of Intelligence. Um, I wonder if you could just give us a sketch of you know, what that new I idea is and, and how it differs from um, the previous thought. Yeah, I think, sure, most people think, even, even most neuroscientists think of the brain the same way the way most AI researchers think about the brain. You have some inputs coming from your sensors and they filter through a series of levels in the brain until some point you have a place that recognizes it. Uh, and those are like the layers in a deep learning network. But what we've learned is that every, every part of the neocortex, uh, and there's about 150,000 of these little columns that constitute your brain, every part is, is actually a complete learning system. So we have like 150,000 little brains in your head. Uh, that's one thing. <laughs> um, it's not like there's one model of the world. There's 150,000 of them. And so this, this is a, a distributed model, which is an important part of the whole system. Um, the second component um, uh, about that, as I mentioned earlier, is we learn through movement. So, um, so even, even the first parts of your brain to get information from your eyes, most people don't think they do much. They think, oh, it's just filtering and get some sort of feature or something like that. But what we've learned is that even the first parts of getting in for your brain and getting from your eyes are learning complete models because they see how information changes over time as we move our eyes or if we move our fingers, or we move our bodies. So when you integrate movement with the input, you can build these complete models. And it's not this big hierarchical you know, filter like people think of it as. It's thousands of models that talk to each other. Um, and it's a very different way of thinking about how knowledge and intelligence is implemented in the brain. Um, it, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a totally new way of thinking about it, and I'm, I'm very confident it's true. So this, let's walk back a little bit. I mean, this idea that we need to understand, um, you know, intelligence, how, it, how we find it in, in nature. Um, why do you think that is the way to building artificial intelligence? Rather, you know, you, there's no reason in principle why, you know, neuroscientists couldn't work over on one side and, you know, understand the brain better. and uh, you know, AI engineers and computer science yeah. people can work over, you know, on the other side of the fence doing their thing. Why, um, other than, you know, we've chosen to use the same word intelligence for the two uh, projects, <laughs> why do we necessarily have to build, build from one side to the other, build a bridge from one side to the other? Well, I, that's a great question. And, and you know, we, when we, um, I think in the end, let's state a, an end goal. The end goal, we're going to have one way intelligent systems. Just like we have one basic way of building computers. You know, there are different flavors of them, but there, there aren't, there aren't going to be six different ways things can be intelligent in the world. There's going to be one, and we're all trying to get there. Um, now, up front, a priori, I couldn't have proven you that going thinking about brains was the, the quickest way to get there. I'm out to bet. Um, when I was young, I looked at the current state of AI, including neural networks, similar to the ones we have today. And I look at the brain, and I said, damn right, the brain is so much more complicated. There's so much more going on that they're peeping about. So I personally felt like the way to get there would be to study brains, but that was a bet. I could have been wrong. Um, and other people said, no, brains are too messy. We don't have to think about them. We'll just think of, you know, we'll be smart and we'll figure this out. 
Well, as you pointed out, and a lot of other people do, we're, our current AI is still pretty dumb. Um, and we have a long way to go. So I think the bet I played out was like the quickest way to get there is to study the brains is paying out. It didn't have to be that way. Uh, but I think it's important to realize we're all heading for the same place. We all want to build intelligent machines uh, that are truly intelligent. And um, there's different, different approaches. It's not like we're going to diverge. We're really going to be converging uh, going forward. So let's talk about um, how it's paying out. I mean, so Numenta, if I understand correctly, um, you know, focused on the neuroscience uh, challenges for several years and recently pivoted to then applying what it had learned about the brain to, to AI. Can you talk a little bit about that transition? I mean, what made you decide that you had discovered enough that you could start you know, implementing that in, in machines and perhaps give us a, a feel for what you're doing with AI at the moment? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, what we did um, as we were going along, we, we we had to feel like we had a roadmap to get to AI. Like we had to know enough to say, oh, we know what to do, at least in principle, uh, to get there. And for many years, we didn't know that. We were just in the in the dark. You know, we we're struggling figuring out what the hell was going on in our head up here. Um, but we did with the, about five years ago. We really had this breakthrough, which which I wrote about in my book, The Thousand Brains, and it has to do with these reference frames and the, and all the different models in your head. And at that point, we said, you know, we can start building this. As you know, I'm an electrical engineer by training, and a, a computer scientist. And and I said, you know, we know enough to do this. And I think I'm not doing it just because we can. I think it's actually essential for the future of humanity that we build intelligent machines. So um, I feel this. We're on a mission here to do this. Um, anyway, we we said we know enough. We can start down this path. And about two years ago, we started transitioning. We used to have a company full of neuroscientists. Now we have a company full of machine learning AI people with a few neuroscientists. Um, but uh, we're down this path. We've been making great progress. I, I've been really thrilled. Uh, I can talk about that, uh, the, the, what, we're, what we're doing. But we have a roadmap. It's literally step by step, these are the things we have to do to implement an engineering problems to solve uh, to get us where we I think we need to be. Can you give us uh, you know, uh, some uh, concrete examples of uh, some AI stuff that you've you've uh, yeah. developed that has been great insight? Yeah, so, you know, um, it, it's sort of an incremental approach in the sense that we we don't want to try to build a brain right up right front, right? We want to go step by step. Um, and so one of the one of the foundation principles uh, that we see in brains is called sparsity, meaning uh, most of the neurons in your head are not active at any point in time. Now, only one or two percent are. And most of the, thing, the neurons aren't connected to each other. It's very, very few of the neurons are connected to each other. And these are, these are not just conveniences or just to save energy. These are fundamental principles of, of computation in the brain. And so we, we started two years ago to implement sparsity in artificial neural networks. Now lots of people are doing it too. Um, we've been able to take existing neural networks and make them anywhere between five and a hundred times faster, which translates into, you know, a 20th or, you know, a tenth or a hundred, one hundredth the power required to do these networks. And so this, they, we're really excited about this. Um, and so we're starting to implement that in real systems. We've also started implementing a better neuron model. So artificial neural networks have a very simple neuron model. Uh, we could a little bit more sophisticated one. And that's starting to allow us to do uh, what's called continuous learning, where you can learn something new without forgetting the old stuff, which is a big problem in AI today. Um, so those are the two the early ones. Uh, but we have a, uh, but we're, we're starting to implement, we're just starting to implement the entire um, stack, as you will, uh, the whole reference frame thing. But we started to start with these first few items, uh, different neuron model and sparsity, uh, before we jump, bite off on the big stuff. Uh, and we have great success. I think it's going to be very commercially valuable. Well, I was going to ask about that. Actually, I mean, you're a you know, proven track record as an entrepreneur and proven track record as, as a scientist. I mean, how much of the you know, business person hat do you wear versus scientist hat? I mean, is there a, well, what's the business model um, in, you know, building yeah, this? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, we've been taking a very, very long-term um, theoretical, scientific, uh, philosophical approach to this. Um, our goal, number one goals have been to understand the brain and then and, and be a catalyst for AI. And um, we have been fortunate that we don't have to focus on near-term commercial viability in, in terms of like that. Um, but we it, we are a commercial enterprise, and so and we don't want to just do this like an academic exercise. So we are working today with uh, several companies in the hardware space, um, 
in, in AI space talking about how to, how to in integrate our theories into their work um, and how to build new processors that can take advantage of this. We're having conversations about that now. Um, so uh, ultimately the business for the momentum, um, it, it might be a licensing business, we might be acquired. Um, I think it's too big for, uh, the field of AI is too big for one company, you know what I'm saying? So we're just trying to, we're trying to be a catalyst in this field and a catalyst accelerates an, um, uh, a reaction, uh, but doesn't get consumed in reaction. So if we come out the other side on a positive financial note, that'd be great. Um, and I think we will. But you know we're not we're not a typical startup where it's saying oh what's our revenue for the next quarter no we're trying to do some big things and we fortunately have the time and resources to be able to do those it's a little bit maybe like deep mind or something like that a smaller version of it yeah well i was going to also ask about deep mind i mean you you mentioned um a few minutes ago uh having a roadmap um and i'm curious about um you know longer term on that roadmap are we still sort of in the realms of something that we'd recognize today as deep learning, you know, but just bolting on, uh, you know, pieces inspired by neuroscience? And this is where I was going to mention DeepMind. You know, they've had some successes with, um, you know, reinforcement learning techniques, which are inspired by, you know, the way that sort of humans learn in a sort of uh, rewards and uh, failure manner. Um, so, I mean, back to start my question with all that in mind is, is, is this still deep learning we're talking about or a new paradigm entirely? No, it's, it's probably a, a completely different paradigm. But uh, again, I don't, we don't want to like just deep learning. I mean, it's a valuable technology. It's not going to go away. Um, so it's not like one's going to replace the other. It, it's just, that's not really intelligent. Um, and so there's a whole other field that will develop, um, which is, and I, I think they'll probably be separate because it's a, it will be a huge break at one point. I mean, look, I think if you wanted to make a machine, if you want to make something that does math, a calculator is going to be better than any human or any AI system, right? If you want to build something that's going to recognize faces, you're probably going to use deep learning. It's going to be better than any human. But if we wanted to build um, machines that are truly intelligent, that can think through problems and not make stupid mistakes and maybe manipulate things in the world like you and I do, that's a different type of uh, AI system. Uh, I don't think they're going to be, uh, they're, they're going to be really separate worlds. Uh, so you can only get so far by tweaking and deep learning, uh, which we're doing in a sense now, but that's not the end goal. And we can tweak deep learning to make it much better, make it more reliable, make it faster, less expensive, but it's still going to be stupid. And um, to get to the real, really intelligent machines, uh, the ones that can can think and manipulate the world and do things like humans can, um, which we will do this, it's going to happen in big time this century. Um, then uh, we have to add this, these reference frames and this sort of thousand models, uh, thousand brains model concept, uh, which no, one's, no one else is doing today. Let me just like, pick you up on that, you know, that, um, you know, you seem quite confident that, you know, we're gonna get to you know, human level intelligence. I mean, I know that in itself is a very loose notion, but, you know, for, <laughs> for the sake of time, let's talk about human level intelligence. Um, what is it that you think, I, you know, that makes you expect that we're going to get there? Is it simply you know, the march of technology or is there something about your understanding of the brain that makes you think uh, you know, this, is, this is something I recognize as something we can build? Well, I think it's, it's similar to what happened in the 1930s with the pioneers of computing, uh, people like uh, Van Neumann and Turing. They kind of, they came across the, the basic principles of what a computer would be. And, and they hadn't built one yet. Um, but it was sort of a mathematical and deep understanding of what computation and algorithms were. And so that's history we can look at. And they knew that computers would be built and they knew that they'd be powerful. They didn't know what they're gonna do. Uh, they, they couldn't envision all the future. They couldn't envision silicon chips and GPS and all this stuff, but they knew that they had discovered these basic principles of computation. I feel very similar now. I feel we've, we've, we kind of understand the basic principles of intelligence. Uh, I've tried to write this in detail in our books and our scientific papers. Um, and, uh, and so we know that, and, and it just, then you can say, well, I, it's like, the, like those pioneers back in the thirties. Well, we're going to do this. I don't see any obstacles to it. There'll be a lot of technical challenges. It won't happen instantly, uh, but, but the basic principles are there. And so, um, I see it as inevitable, uh, that we can do it. Uh, I also think it's beneficial, so we will do it. Uh, so that, I, that's the best analogy I can make in, 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 you know, it's a speculation and you might think I'm being too bold about it. Uh, but that's, I feel very confident in that. I, I wouldn't have said it otherwise. 
I'm sure you wouldn't. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, you know, I'm always going to, if I get someone saying that to me, then I'm always going to uh, ask you, what makes you so sure? Um, it gets sticking this idea of, you know, human level intelligence. Um, again, I mean, in one sense, it's an obvious answer. I was going to ask, why uh, are we stuck on the idea that, um, you know, artificial intelligence has to be human-like rather than uh, animal-like or even something that we've never even, even seen before? Um, and I suppose the obvious answer is that, you know, as far as we know, it's the, sort of the best example of intelligence we have. And yet, surely there are a lot of shortcomings that come with that. We know we have cognitive biases. Yeah. We know that um, we can't easily distinguish sort of our reasoning from our emotional side. We have extremes of you know, anger and hatred that, you know, we don't want to engineer into any future machine. So yeah. where do we carve, yeah. um, you know, the bits of intelligence we want? I, that's from that's a, super important. I'm glad you brought it up there because we don't want, I don't want to build human-like things. That's not our goal. We, you know, there's not to recreate a human, have someone walk around and have them your pal. Maybe someone don't want to do that. But it's, intelligence is a lot, it's, it's a subset of what humans are. We have, as you point out, we have all these emotional baggage. We have bodies that have all kinds of problems and issues and so on. And we don't really want to capture that necessarily. There's no point in that. And I think if you go out in the future, intelligent machines won't, most of them won't be anything like humans at all. They won't look like us. They won't act like us. Um, but they will be intelligent. They'll, be, they'll have a model of the world. They'll be able to act on the world and understand what's going on out there. But they don't have to be physically or emotionally or anything else like a human. They, they will have a lot of variables on this. So the goal is not human level. In fact, as you point out, I think if you look at computing, most of the computing um, applications of the world are very small computers embedded in places. So we'll have a lot of small embedded AI systems that are not that smart. They're like maybe as smart as a cat or, or a rat or something, right? Um, or an octopus. But but um, so it's not like, oh, the goal is to be superhuman. No, the goal is to be machines that are intelligent, that solve problems that we can deploy through society and business and, and governance uh, in ways to help humans. Um, and they will not be human-like. We won't be overrun by, you know, Terminator-like, you know, robots and things like that. It's it'll be very kind of boring, actually, uh, from a um, from a sci-fi point of view. <laughs> uh, I mean, there'll still be build, there'll still be machines that we build, um, which tend to be quite boring. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like, you know, people are worried about computers, right? When computers were built, they felt like, oh, these are going to be, you know, they thought they had the same fears, like that they'd be human-like or take, you know. But they don't really, we just, we merge them into our, our industry and our society. And I think AI will be like that as well. There will, of course, be some AI machines that look really smart, or maybe people try to make them look like humans. But that's not what intelligence is about. Um, intelligence is about mm -hmm. just modeling the world and being able to act on it in clever ways, um, where today's AI doesn't really do that. Right, right. I mean, today's machines have as much intelligence as we want to project on them. And you know, most yeah, of the problems that they raise, it, yeah. uh, you know, are problems of our own, our own making. Um, but where, you know, time is ticking away, we've got just over five minutes left. I want to um, not dwell on this too much, but we had audience questions seeking this uh, sort of the you know, biological natural world analogy. One person asked, you know, what are the chances of sort of um, setting, off the, setting off a sort of machine evolution where we, you know, put the right things in place and then, you know, the, these brains, you know, evolve in, in, in some way. Yeah. Um, Sorry, just I just want to add like a, a, a the second part to that. If that were to happen, then um, what should we think of the chances of, of consciousness uh, automatically emerging? Well, okay, those are, those are two very different questions. I would say um, first of all, there's a and lot of people worried about this. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people worried about it, and um, uh, I, I would just point out that uh, evolution and self-replication are different things in intelligence. Right, so you can make intelligent machines that don't evolve, and you can make intelligent machines that don't replicate. In fact, it would be very hard to do those things. So we don't have to worry about these things just evolving on their own. They're not going to just go off and pro recreate and so on. Um, they're going to be what we designed to be. They we don't we we'll have to train them, but we they'll be they're not going to do that. The second question about consciousness, um, I, I wrote a whole chapter about this in the book because I think so many people misunderstand what uh, consciousness is. Um, it is not terribly mystifying. And uh, we, it'll be an option. If we want a machine to be conscious, we can make them conscious. But I actually think most will be because consciousness is primarily the ability to remember things, you, your previous states of thought, uh, to be able to recall what you were thinking and, uh, and what you were imagining a moment ago. That's its, at its core. And we want machines to do that too. Otherwise, you won't know why you did something. You know, 
why did I go to the kitchen? I have to remember that I was looking for something in the refrigerator. <laughs> um, machines need to know that too. Uh, AI systems have no, you know, sense of this today. They have no idea what they were doing a little moment ago. Um, but I, I think machines will be conscious, and I don't think it's a scary thing at all. Uh, it, again, it doesn't make them like humans. It just means they can they can reflect upon themselves. I, I want to end, um, just spend the last few minutes. At the end of your book, um, you sort of raise this question, you know, why do this at all? And it's one of my favorite parts of the book because in most practical discussions of AI, you know, the nuts and bolts, you don't also then step back and say, you know, have this grand human sort of vision of, of why we're doing it. And, in all our human arrogance, why build machines that are, that are intelligence? Um, and you sort of hit this note by saying, actually, perhaps the, the sort of the, the final goal of humankind is not to pass on its genes, but to pass on its intelligence. And for that, we need to give it to machines. So it's it's an answer to you know why build AI in the first place that I hadn't heard before. Um, I just want you to you know, just talk a little bit about that. I mean, where where did this come from? And um, you know, is is that really what sort of drives you? It is really what drives me. I mean, like many people, um, I, I deeply want to understand why we're here. What's the point of it all? Is there meaning to it? You know, the, uh, the, the rational scientific point of view is kind of bleak sometimes. Like, yeah, we're just a bunch of atoms floating around in the middle of a big monstrous space, right? Um, what's the point of it all? And, but if you think about humans, what's, what's unique about this? Uh, it's not that we have a liver and a spleen or, you know, we procreate and have sex or things like that. It's that we're the only species that knows anything about the universe. We're the only species that knows the earth is a sphere. We're the only species that knows about the history of time or, you know, quantum physics or, or, or the, how we got here, evolution. So knowledge is what makes us unique. And other than that, we're just like any other animal. And, um, and so that's the thing we should be preserving. That's the thing we should be worrying about, uh, not preserving our genetic background necessarily, but preserving our knowledge. And I mean, preserving it for, for forever um, and, and propagating knowledge around the universe as opposed to propagating genes. So to me, that gives a purpose to being a human uh, is to think about we are the first species to know things and we need to do more of it, figure out more things and we need to preserve it and propagate it. And, and we come from this heritage of just, you know, life has always been about propagating genes, whether we knew it or not, that's what it was. Um, so, uh, I guess it, it, to me, an intelligent machines it, it really far out, we're talking a hundred years from now. So they are the we, way we'll be able to do this. We'll be, they're the way we'll be able to accrue more knowledge and, and, and spread it throughout the universe. Uh, that's a bit sci-fi, but I really think it's a, a long-term desirable goal. It, it certainly made me think differently when I'm, you know, when I first read it. Um, um, but it's also, I find it's, it's a chilling responsibility in, in a way as well, but, um, <laughs> You know, ultimately, it's all about what we leave behind. Is that going to be a pile of trash or something worth finding? Yeah, and also we've got to make sure we don't destroy ourselves before we get there, right? So we <laughs> we have to do that too, right? Um, we have a lot of challenges. Um, and by the way, you know, intelligent machines will help us with all these challenges, it, it, big time. And I just I think they're going to be so important for the future of humanity that it's um, it's it's worthy to work on, and and they have practical benefits now too. So. It's all good. Yeah, we're certainly seeing that. But I mean, it's, I think it's worth stepping back and, you know, really asking the questions of, you know, what it's all for. Um, and I think we've done that this morning. Um, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a pleasure to, to talk to you. You too, Will. Thank you. And thanks for all those great questions. It's fun to talk about these things.